Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Kitelo from uh, the Agie community, uh, Mount Elgon. Uh, as my friend, just to make, a, it wasn't a few days, Chip I was to come with her, actually, same flight. Uh, it wasn't a few days, it was actually the day. It was on Friday, I think five in the morning, so yeah. Uh, I will try to also cover some work that, uh, because we work together, it's not like uh, she does her work with her community and mine with my community. So uh, there would be places that uh, uh, will, will cross. In fact, even our presentations were to have places that uh, they cross. Uh, I would divide my presentation into two. Uh, one would be just to give an introduction and how I, I, I came into uh, being part of the uh, land struggles for forest communities in Kenya, and specifically my community. And then the other one is, uh, would be specifically to my community, the work that we do with other people, uh, the, forest uh, the, the forest communities in Kenya. Uh, I've said my name, uh, Peter Kitelo. Uh, I'm associated with an organization called uh, Chepkitale Indigenous People Development Program, uh, and also the Forest Indigenous Peoples Network. Uh, I came to this uh, struggle uh, not by choice, really. Uh, I came to it uh, because uh, when I was young, uh, we were involved uh, in uh, the war evictions in our community. Of course, those years, you see evictions and you don't, there's nothing you can do about it. It's other people who work, who do that. Uh, I got involved really in the struggle in the year 2000, after I finished uh, my university education. Uh, and uh, it was... Uh, a day that we had organized a meeting, uh, innocently. After university, we wanted to organize a meeting whereby the youths come together and we discuss issues, especially issues of land struggles, because all the time we could see our parents, uh, uh, you know, talking about struggles, talking about evictions, and uh, there's nothing, uh, sometimes nothing, because of limitations, education, there was nothing much they could do about it. So we were going to discuss as you know, young people how we could get involved in the struggle also. And uh, that day, I can't remember the day very well, but uh, it was in 2000. Um, in the morning, uh, I was organizing the meeting with a friend of mine that we had finished together. And in the morning, we had gotten all the licenses that are required to do public meetings. But in that morning, we, when we were going to the venue, we, we found out that around, I think, not less than 70. Uh, it was about 100 uh, paramilitary police had come and occupied the place. And uh, when we were coming in, uh, because we were young people, and, uh, and, and we, 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 we actually, we were told, you know, we were not going to do the meeting. And we were not going there expecting, uh, in, in, in the least imagination, we were not expecting that there would be uh, police there waiting for us and, you know, riot and all this. So uh, we did do the meeting, but that's the day really that, uh, you know, uh, I saw that there was a big struggle, that it was something that needed more than just, uh, you know, doing meetings. And of course, we, st we continue doing meetings, but this time at night. So. Uh, but that was really the introduction that I got to the struggle. And then from that time, because we asked them why were they uh, coming and, and saying we should not continue with the meeting, and I was, uh, they said uh, the meeting is illegal. Of course it was an excuse that, you know, if you had organized in form of, you know, who are you organizing this meeting, you're organizing as who? And that was really the start of, uh, we started thinking about having an organization, and that's where Chepkitale Indigenous People Development Project came in because we thought if it was about a certificate, we can register an organization that we could use for, you know, meetings. 
so, uh, and I'm still associated with that organization to date. It's uh, more, it brings together the Ogier community of Mount Elgon. So that's about myself. And uh, uh, about the work uh, since that time, um, that time was also the time of constitutional making in Kenya. It was a time whereby uh, I mentioned about evictions. Whenever there were uh, Kenya Forest Service evicting members of our communities, they would always say, the law says so. That it's up to you, um, I mean, follow the law. So, that, uh, so it was an opportune time because that was the time that we, you know, we ended up engaging with the constitutional making process. And uh, we managed to have a few, uh, actually one line. For us, you know, constitution is uh, it's a discussion. For us, we only had a line talking about uh, ancestral lands and lands traditionally occupied by hunter gatherers being part of community lands. That's what uh, we managed, uh, of course, with other people, uh, other communities. We managed to have it in the, con uh, in the constitution. And that is what we hang on up to today when we are advocating for our land rights. Um, okay, that, that's the, just a, a small map showing uh, our country, uh, our countryside. That is the, the land, Chepkitale, viewed from the central place called uh, Labot. Um, it's a mountainous, and uh, really what it's showing is what is there uh, this season. Uh, this time of the year, it's cloudy, and the uh, mountains as, as green as you can see. And uh, uh, that's where communities derive, uh, the Agia community of Mount Elgon derive their livelihoods. Uh, majorly they do uh, pa uh, pastoralism, uh, hunting and gathering. Although we don't say hunting in Kenya because hunting was outlawed in uh, sometimes in the 70s. So yeah, that's our countryside. And uh, I decided to just have a, a small map showing uh, uh, just for the people in this room to appreciate that that's the country Kenya. And uh, the place I'm talking about is, uh, uh, if you can see on that, uh, sorry, um, on the map, this is the western part of Kenya and the Agia community is, uh, that's Mount Elgon. So, that's where <coughs> you'll see more uh, better a better map later. Uh, yeah, that's uh, a map that we did. Uh, we are still doing mapping. We haven't yet finished, but that shows you a map of the you know the community land that <coughs> I'll, uh, I'm talking about. Uh, you can see this is the outer boundary of our community lands. Uh, we did that mapping. It's still something, it's ongoing, because we haven't, after we did the, 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 the map ourselves, we would want to negotiate with the, not really negotiate, but uh, talk with the neighboring communities about this. And then you know, uh, community lands also, some, sometimes the lines are dotted. So that is really work in progress. And from this, uh, out of the other forest communities in Kenya, we have se six of them. We are the first ones to do this, and we would want to help other communities also, because without a map, it's very difficult to, uh, to negotiate with government. So that's uh, still work in progress. Uh, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to, to it uh, shortly, but I wanted to show you the upper part of it, this is the area that we are actually uh, struggling over. You can see it has all the land uh, protected area classifications you can have in Kenya. It has uh, the, the forest, the green ones are the forest, and then this is the national park. And then uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, where the community is at the moment. So I said I'll come to it later. Uh, from that map, really, it's, uh, it, 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 it shows you, um, from it, I would want to describe, you know, this, uh, why we have ended up to being confined to this area only. 
uh, during the colonial time, that is up to 1930, uh, from the 1934 up to independence, 1960 in Kenya, the community was actually moved from this area to pave way for the white uh, settlers. And when Kenya got independence, that part was parceled to you know more influential people and communities in Kenya. So we never got that area back. And then still within the colonial time, we were uh, confined to the upper areas of the mountain. And the forest down here were converted to, uh, to, <coughs> to conservation area. That's the forest. And we were not supposed to go into these areas. And these are the areas with forests. We also have caves. Uh, medicinal plants are on these areas because this is actually the moorlands. So the community was, you know, using all these areas uh, during the seasons because it's also moving with the, with the seasons. Uh, and then during independent Kenya, more of this area, this was created in 1968 to pave way for, uh, it's a national park and then more communities were forcefully evicted, and all of them were confined to this area. And then sometimes, uh, actually in 2000, that's when I go to the struggle, in 2000, the last bit of it, which was a native reserve, which was a community land or trust lands, for those who uh, uh, know about trust lands, it, is, it, was, it was land for community, really, to make it simple, was converted to a game reserve, which is another protected area. And uh, uh, that is when we started looking at other options, in, uh, use, uh, including the legal address. But initially, when that conversion happened, when we asked the government why was it converting it, with, and we didn't have an idea, you know, they said, uh, you are local government. And when, in, in our case, Okay, I will make it short. Uh, in our case, the local government was really a government that is outside the community. Uh, it wasn't part of the community. So it was converted to a game reserve, and in that time, we went to, we negotiated with them. They told us to negotiate. We didn't manage. So after eight years, in 2008, we went to court. And uh, that case has been in court up to, up to today. In fact, as I speak today, uh, it's coming up tomorrow. And uh, we really hope, uh, because we've had a negotiation to a, to a place whereby we seem to be in agreement that they are saying they want to give us back our land. So uh, I would urge members in this community to meditate for us so that tomorrow we have a good court outcome. Uh, and that has been a process that maybe uh, I would maybe get some other opportunity some other time. It's been a process of negotiating with government. Uh, using, uh, we took advantage of uh, Wakatane, which I think my, the next presenter might talk about it more. Uh, it was bringing communities. Uh, I would go straight to that because it, a process of Wakatani, it is bringing the different actors together to come and have a discussion on the shared interest about a natural resource. So in our case, it was the community, it was the conservation agencies, that KWS, KFS, and uh, any other people. You know, looking at, 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 at the land and people and uh, natural resources as a shared, uh, you know, as something shared. So that is, we, we, we came up with a shared uh, vision, and that, that is what led to this out of court negotiation that I'm j I was just talking about, that we hope we are having a good settlement. And then uh, that's just one of the community uh, meetings where we were discussing uh, the community bylaws. Uh, community bylaws because uh, we wondered also, the government kept on telling us, you know, how do you take care of this land? So we wanted to write down, uh, of course, we use our traditional laws, and we wanted to write them down for, for the government. And we have uh, bylaws now that we've documented. And those are just the key uh, principles. 
And then uh, this, this is what happens. This is actually about two, about two months ago, whereby even when we are having negotiations, the government is still coming and you know, burning people's houses. But it's difficult because you cannot run away or refuse again to do the negotiations. You, th this is an ongoing thing that uh, uh, we have to live, to live with. Do the negotiations and yet, you know, there's those burnings. So uh, that's an, in a nutshell. I think uh, I would uh, be available. We, we, we're trying to get some few mon uh, minutes at the end of it so that maybe I can make clarifications and answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, really lovely to be here. I uh, haven't been in Canada for a while, and it's always a delight to meet people who care about these issues and these lands, and it's really lovely to be on this land and to walk out to the river this morning and to listen out there. Absolutely gorgeous. Really, really lovely. Um, right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, this morning, about five o'clock, when I couldn't sleep, um, I had a flick through the Guardian website, as you do, and came across this article from yesterday uh, titled, The Tribes Paying the Brutal Price of Conservation. And underneath it, the subheading, um, across the world, governments are protecting habitats, but indigenous peoples are being evicted. And that's wrong. Governments are not protecting habitats. But that's the story that we're told, that you have to pay the human rights price. Indigenous peoples need to be pushed off their land because we have to protect the environment. That's the story we're told. And the story that Catello and I and Milka uh, and the others are trying to tell about what's happening in Kenya is that uh, when communities have secure tenure to their lands, they can think long term, they can stop others from destroying their lands. When they haven't got secure tenure, then the lands are destroyed. So this is John Vidal's article in The, in the Guardian yesterday. Um, and in it, I was interested to see that all the people who are quoted, uh, Vicky from uh, the Special Rapporteur, uh, Kristen from C Conservation International, Gonzalo and Aroha from uh, IUCN, Simon Council from Rainforest Foundation, all the key people that they're quoting, everybody, is coming to the Wakatani workshop uh, at the end of this week. And that's kind of interesting to me because I have been wanting to ditch we're doing the Wakatani work because it's a big deal for IUCN, which is this massive organization that encompasses all the kind of people who say they're concerned about conservation. Wakatani is for them a way of saying we're addressing the issue of the rights of indigenous peoples. Yeah, Wakatani is a way of them saying, look, we're doing something about it. This, we're setting up dialogues in protected areas where indigenous peoples, local communities, have not had their rights respected. We're trying to do something. And yet, since 2011, there have been just three of these processes in the 160,000 protected areas. Three. So I've, I'm going to this workshop, and it's, I was assuming nobody would turn up. It turns out they're all turning up. So that's kind of good. It shows, I think, that they're concerned that actually nothing is happening and they're going to look rather foolish. And so I guess I just wanted to bring that into here, that the conservation tends to be seen as the solution, when certainly, uh, from our experience, it's very much the problem. Something that Katana said a long time ago was, uh, it's not that we conserve, it's our way of life that conserves. So there's something about restoring and protecting and sustaining people's ways of life, rather than bringing conservationists to take over the territory. Okay, so, just very, I'll be very brief. African Commission's definition of indigenous people in Africa, because as you know, that term is a tricky one in Africa because the governments say, well, we're all indigenous, so why should we have any special rights for these people? That's the argument of government, so they can then evict people from their lands and not have to abide by you know, the World Bank safe safeguards and so on. The Commission says, defines indigenous peoples, and nobody should be defining indigenous peoples, but it's useful in this context to have something to refer to when you're arguing with government. Uh, they're saying these are people with strong attachment to distinct lands and distinct livelihood systems, which result in their structural discrimination. And we've heard many times permanent secretaries of the environment ridiculing Ogiek and Sengwe for being concerned about their lands. You're ridiculous for staying backward like that, they're described. And, and I've noticed it quite a lot in Canada also, people having that sense of, you know, either these First Nations are different and distinct and backward, or they're actually just the same as us, and they're just pretending so that they can get a few rights that we haven't got. That's, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm being very crude there. That's just what I kind of hear when I come here. Not from you guys, but I hear that when I'm with my nice liberal friends. You know, it's kind of, that's, that's curious. Anyway, I won't tell you about your own lives. Um, 
In sub-Saharan Africa, 1.6 billion hectares, 75% of the land is managed by communities, but 98% of that land is owned by states. So this is where you have this clash between the realities of people's lived experience and the realities of power, which is government control. And as Kitoa said, in, in Kenya, forest peoples are forbidden from living on their lands, and they're not allowed to hunt, while the constitution he was referring to does recognize their rights to have their lands, but nevertheless, the elites have, have control. They keep trumping that argument. So just to quote Milka, who can't be here, um, in describing the consequence of the evictions that have been happening forever, but that intensified under a World Bank uh, conservation project uh, that was designed supposedly to help secure community land tenure. So the Sangwe said, great, and the Yogic said, great. It was also designed to strengthen the Kenya Forest Service, which sounds like it's an organization that should protect forests, but it's not. It's an organization which is very much there to exploit forests and take control of them. And she describes the consequence of evictions. Um, verbal abuse and physical violence, including sexual violence, often take place. Evictions make women and their families vulnerable to illness and extreme poverty due to the destruction of shelter, leading to extreme cold at night at this high altitude. And the destruction of household properties fundamental to staying warm, fed, clothed, and able to care for children. So this is ongoing. This is happening right now. As Kato said, that was two months ago uh, at Mount Elgin. It's go going on now at Emberbutt. This is a continuous, and as Kato said, there's dialogue. But as dialogues happen, you always get KFS coming to burn homes in order to provoke the saying world, you'll get to leave the dialogue so that they can say, look, these guys aren't even up for talking with us. Yeah? It's, a, it's a deliberate ploy to always come in and cause as much chaos as possible. Because they want there to be a conflict. They want people to think there's a conflict between community rights to land and conservation. They always frame this as conflict resolution. And in fact, it's framed that way uh, at IUCN as well. It's framed as how do we resolve the conflict between conservation and communities? How can we sort this desperately difficult problem out? There isn't a problem, or the problem is different, if you focus on securing these people's rights to their land and their ability to think and act over the long term. Then there's no clash. Yeah, the clash is within communities between those who don't really care and those who do. You then get to the real clash that we all have between in ourselves, between when we're concerned and when we're not, when we're grabbing, when we're not grabbing. That's a much deeper and much more real clash that we have, each of us, I would suggest, I do. And so forest peoples are offering a very simple win-win solution, that they should be acknowledged as traditional forest dweller communities, rather than have their very existence denied, which happens all the time. There are no Sengwe at Emberbutt. Secondly, to have their principal lands, their forests returned to them, as the Constitution says, and to be allowed to conserve their forests in the interests of, uh, of all. So just going to the kind of larger frame, I work for Forest People's Program. Um, which I love doing. I worked for them since kind of early 90s and then stopped for 10 years when my kids were too young and I couldn't travel. And I had to lecture at university, which was great fun. I love teaching, but I don't like institutions. They don't do me any good health. Uh, so I was very happy to, as soon as I could, when they were old enough, to come back into working for Forest People's Program uh, in Africa. And we work, we work across the world, as you'll hear. Um, but in Africa, we're focused on the forest belt, obviously. And we have very large projects in the Congo Basin, Cameroon, Liberia. In Kenya, it's very small, and I would suggest that very small projects can be the most effective, <laughs> but we'll discuss that within FPP. But uh, when you have big funders giving you big money, you have to come up with big results that look impressive, and therefore you don't do the little tiny work that needs to happen to actually make the changes, yeah? to actually elicit the hypocrisy you need from the powerful and stay committed in the personal relations at the ground that are needed to make that long-term change happen. So I would just, a slight word of warning, be wary of very large projects. They can be really helpful if the finance allows you then to really do what you need to do on the ground. Then they're great. Money's incredibly helpful. If, if you find them pulling you off away from what you need to be doing, then really rethink. And maybe that's something that you'll be looking at this week. I don't know. I'm not, not sure what, what the focus is on that. So globally, um, I guess the question I would like to ask is, can communities pin down Leviathan? You know, the big Gulliver's travel, big guy, you know? There's capitalism, there's state-enforced capitalism, there's capitalism using the state to enforce itself, there's that very obvious, straightforward process we all know of happening in the world that just keeps creating these false choices. Oh, it's forest or it's people, you know? This, these false choices, when actually it's not, the false choices are, are not real. And communities look very small. The object is a small place. You know, community in Vancouver Island, a small place. Community in northern Quebec, maybe a big place, but not that many numbers. <laughs> um, you know, it can look, they can all look small, but when you put all those smalls together, that's actually all of us. Um, 
And so the dominant story is that we used to have community lands, and then we've been privatized, and we're all going to individual lands. But the community story is that we've been cleared from our lands, and we are fighting to retain or regain those lands. And I want to come on to Scotland, where I live, in a moment, to say this is something that's of the future, not just of the past, in terms of the work uh, that's going on and the, the shift that's happening in Scotland around community lands. And it's, so that's firstly, do community lands have a future? And obviously, we're told no, and we say yes, and we know yes. Does conservation have a future is the more important question, I think, because I think it's obvious community lands are the future. The colonial approach appropriates lands, and in Africa, up to 14 million people have been evicted from their lands by protected areas being created. 14 million people, that's a lot of people to be. I know John Muir from down the road from me at Dunbar in Edinburgh, great man with a great vision for the environment and also part of a whole process and used as a symbol uh, that allows people to be pushed off their lands. So there's a whole national park movement in, in North America that came from over our way and apologize for that bit. Uh, not for the care and the concern, but for the way of doing it and the damage. And the science is very clear, C4 studies, Clue studies and so on, World Bank studies that show that communities protect forests six times better, a lot times better, and especially in the very worst areas. In Brazil, on the frontier areas, very clear that that's, it's the communities, the indigenous peoples who are protecting the lands, whereas the national parks are just not effective to the same degree. And worse in Africa, national parks are used to destroy not just communities, but forests themselves, and to destroy the elephants. One of the Kenya Wildlife Service people in, uh, in Kenya said that if you move the Ogiek from Mount Elgin, then you might as well forget about the elephants. Whereas on the Uganda side of Mount Elgin, which is a strict protected area, no community there, all the elephants are gone. Yeah, strict conservation is a strict destruction of communities and the environment too. So in the 2008 uh, World uh, Conservation Congress, the Wakatani mechanism was kind of, well, the idea for a mechanism came up, a resolution was passed to develop a mechanism to address the historical and current injustice against indigenous peoples by the creation of conservation areas. That was the decision. We must address this injustice, this ongoing injustice against indigenous peoples. And in 2011, the uh, Wakatani began for, uh, from uh, set up in, in New Zealand. And uh, this whole move towards rights, towards recogni re recognized rights happens. But I would suggest, and this isn't something that people are talking about particularly, I would suggest there's been a big pushback against this. We've often talked about the fact that in conservation now there is the talk about rights, the hypocrisy, which I love, I love hypocrisy, I think it's really helpful. People are hypocritical, you then hold them to their words. It's a very straightforward way of making change happen. So hypocrisy, it's a good thing, as long as you don't believe it. If you believe it, you're in trouble, but if you don't believe it, it's great. Um, but I'd say that hypocrisy is fading now. So I've been in a uh, very strong dialogue with conservationists and social scientists um, in Europe and the States where they're shifting from a rights focus to an equity focus. That sounds fine. Equity, it's a good thing. We should all have an equal share. That sounds good. But actually what happens there is you shift from recognizing the rights of particular people to particular places to saying they must have an equal share. They must have some benefit sharing. They must have some compensation. It slips and slips and slips until it's just compensation that's appropriated by others. So beware of that shift from rights to equity. Just beware of it in, if you're in this area at all. And the other thing is beware of the shift from place to landscapes. There's a big shift in IUCN and across the world in conservation from a focus on particular places, the rights of particular communities to their lands, territories, to the landscape approach. Now landscape, what a word. It can go on forever. It's not territories. It's not these people's lands, it's the landscape. Well, and the landscape really goes everywhere. It goes right the way across. And what that allows the powers that be to do is to start saying, okay, the needs of the larger landscape, the needs of the larger population trump the rights of these particular peoples. And of course, it's not the needs of all these people, it's the power of the elites who control that larger political system that then trumps the rights of those. So beware of that shift too, the shift from rights to equity, the shift from place to landscape. So, going to IUCN, which I didn't want to go to their meeting uh, at the end of this week, um, but it now looks like it might be useful, but it's international meetings are completely useless. Not this one. <laughs> when people have common values, they're not useless. And I'm assuming common values here from the few people that I know here, assuming common values, and values are really fundamental. When it's common institutions, it's a very different state of affairs. And I should say just to end, because I just see the blinking going up, I'm an anthropologist. And for me, anthropology is fundamentally about engaging in the world to try and ensure that people are valued. Anthropology is about valuing others. 
That's what anthropology is. It's not an academic discipline. It's not a whatever else. It's about valuing others and insisting that others value others too. So when you see people not valuing others, then you object. Yeah? It's a political stance, it's a moral stance, anthropology. I just want to end with that, because to me that's fundamentally what I think, if those of you are anthropologists, that's a very basic value base, not a discipline. It's a fundamental way of engaging the world. Okay, thank you. Are these on? Is this on? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I wish I could say we've had to deal with the problem of big money, <laughs> <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, uh, both of you, for uh, um, very uh, a poignant uh, presentation of, uh, of a case in an area and a set of issues. I'm sure there are some, some comments, and we, we, we have... Uh, Let's take uh, 10 minutes. Uh. John. So thank you very much for these presentations. I, I, uh, as somebody who works in Kenya but doesn't know much about the Western part, this was uh, very illuminating. So thank you for that, uh, Peter and, and uh, Justin, for putting the, the whole set of issues into a much larger global uh, context. Of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit intrigued by the, the anti-institutional perspective um, that you, you presented because one of the things that's come out of the struggles for indigenous peoples in, uh, in, in Kenya and, and elsewhere is their synergy with, with local uh, non-governmental organizations which is, have been spawned and have become a, a, a tremendous uh, force for... Um, community level, attentive, uh, informed uh, political action. So I'm wondering uh, whether we can really think about the steps that you suggested, both in terms of the uh, establishing community-based uh, management of, of these areas without thinking of, of it through institutions. If it's not institutionalized, it becomes ephemeral. And it, it doesn't have the sort of um, uh, sinews of tenacity that one would, would want to expect. So I, I just wonder, let me throw that out to you, uh, the, the, the question of, of how we can think about institutions in a, in a, a constructive way that will give these uh, initiatives greater length, uh, greater legs, and uh, a longer perspective. Okay, um, this is not, it's on. is it on? Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, that, that's <coughs> a good, uh, that's a very good observation. And uh, uh, I could say like, for example, myself, the kind of work I do, uh, the last one year, I've stopped going for international meetings. This is the first one, actually, after one and a half years, because I realized, uh, like you're saying, you know, about Kenya, there's a lot of uh, laws that are being developed, community land bill, forestry bill, uh, historical injustices, which has hanged. I found out that when I get out, you normally need to take a few weeks to prepare for a meeting, go for it for a week, so that's almost a month. And things happen. Like today, for example, I've just said tomorrow our, th there's uh, a community, you know, a case uh, coming up, and we've been negotiating because tomorrow is just an end of a very long process. So if you have institutions, like, for example, uh, you know, you're given money based on uh, attending a meeting, you know, just an example, then you fail the principal idea of why you get, you, we need to, help communities. In Kenya, for example, and forest communities, what we've been doing, I just mentioned about community bylaws. Uh, and uh, communities being the ones to develop uh, their own, uh, you know, bylaws, which is, they are different. Every community has their different way of managing their lands. If it can be accepted in principle, for example, that we are helping communities uh, to own and manage their lands, it's not 
uh, all the forest communities have the same way of owning and uh, even owning is different. Others would want to own as families, others as clans, others as the whole community. So uh, I think that is the discussion that uh, uh, we are having also in Kenya, that, you know, the institutions uh, like the Forest Indigenous uh, uh, Forest Indigenous Peoples Network is a, is a network that is recognizing communities, each community to do their work, but on matters uh, engaging with government is the same. So I think th that is a, that's how uh, we've tried, or we are trying to address that issue of you know the, the institutions and, and 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 really having communities do uh, what they want to do, the, you know, self determination. Yeah, I, I should just say that I'm not against it. I mean, I'm. Institutions, uh, what I meant was really, money's great, by the way. <laughs> Lots of money's very useful. And institutions can be very helpful if they're based on shared values. And there's a proliferation of NGOs that are out to get money. That's not a very helpful approach. There are a proliferation of ways of, like Kito was describing, of, of communities developing and NGOs also who are really concerned and passionately care about issues. And that's great. But it's, it's making sure the value base is in there, which is, which is fundamental as to whether it's going to be tenacious and last or not, I think. Brian. Yeah, thank you both for the interesting presentations. Justin, you were talking about how important uh, security of tenure is in these uh, visions of moving forward. <coughs> Can you elaborate a little bit on how important the actual form of the tenure is, whether it's a freehold title or, you know, some sort of communal land holding or, you know, how important is the actual shape of the land tenure that we're talking about to the, to the process? Tell about it better to answer that, having just referred to the difference between different communities wanting different different forms. Yeah. Uh, f first of all, uh, uh, just like you take care of your garden because it's yours. <coughs> so I think that's the mo the, the, the bottom line that uh, communities, you know, uh, and uh, communities would take or want to take their lands because it's theirs. And uh, the form of tenure. Uh, like in Kenya, for example, uh, the form of tenure has been described, uh, you know, you, it, it, and, and every community also, I'm just referring to the community land bill, every community uh, has their own way of wanting to own the land. And not really wanting, but that's how they've owned. It's only it's not been recognized. So uh, others like ours, uh, ownership was as per clans, but use and management is as per the community. So others would want, those who do some farming would want to even go to having families owning some plots within their community lands where they can do, you know, their, their you know, family, like grow food and all that. So it's not, it's not really, it's not the same. The way you look at land is different from one community to another. And, uh, that's the tenure for that, that it's that, that's what you know tenureship tenure is about what how one community wants to own and it's not the same for every con community if i just add one thing um certainly i know Mil milka would add this that for sangwa women for example they're very clear they don't want individual <coughs> title they want collective community title and that's the key thing however you frame it whether it's clan level or whatever level it's at if it's collective, then you can keep it secure. If it's individual, it's going to be alienated. So even having a nice gender distribution and so on is going to not help in the end. They're very clear that that's going to lead to, to the alienation of their lands. I think uh, Vivian was the next, uh, next hand up, sorry. Um, and we're at zero time, so I guess a quick intervention and we'll have to hold others. Okay, um, thank you for a great presentation. I, I'm interested in, in your writing down of your own law for the state and what kind of effect that had um, within the communities. Um, you know, um, did it create any conflict or has it strengthened uh, your traditional authority making by writing it down? So what are the effects of writing down your own law? Uh, first of all, uh, writing down our bylaws was for us to use it to negotiate with government. Because really, community bylaws are things that are within community. And uh, they don't need to write it anyway. 
but we wrote ours for that. Uh, in terms of, because what this came up with was also to have like management, and that's, I think that's where you're saying, uh, you, you, you're talking, you know, having <coughs> community representatives, because that was new. Uh, I can say, because it's three years ago, actually we want to review it, we, not review, but we need to, we say the, the, the community leadership has to be, uh, you know, changed after three years, eh? or accepted after three years. This is the third year. We couldn't because the time we wanted to do is when the KFS came and did the burning. So, uh, but I think by and large it has, uh, the, the last three years, it has really strengthened the community. The community is able to, to talk. The people that want to get to the community can be told you go, you know, you know, so uh, talk with so-and-so because these things are also, if they, they are not there, you know, communities are divided. People go and, you know, take a few community members and say these are the community representatives. So on, on another way, at maybe for us, it's, it's really helped us uh, negotiate with government in a way that the government cannot say, you know, you are divided, because that is what they like. Uh, but writing down does lead to some interesting things happening. So, for example, that <coughs> April meeting, uh, where there was a decision around um, st having a moratorium on hunting small antelope, and the young men who were off hunting weren't at the meeting. I thought they'd be kind of cross when they got back. Mm. Uh, but when they got back, they were really relieved. They'd had to travel a long way, and that meant that the, the young antelope would, would uh, replenish. So there was a whole... It is quite interesting that you get... It does allow a space for internal dialogue. Um, but I guess that dialogue has gone, for, gone on forever. It was just new to me, that. Okay, uh, um, apologies, Leo. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna be chronically in the situation of not, not getting to every, every question or comment, but I would really urge you to use the notepads uh, and to uh, register important issues and to uh, pass them to us, or if you prefer to process them on your uh, computers and email them to us, that's, that's fine too. Uh, we want, th this is all a really important uh, uh, reflection uh, and we don't want to lose it just because we are running short of time. Um, okay, uh, Catello, Justin, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll move now to um, Um, from um, another continent and another forest, um, uh, uh, presentation by Hector Jaime Velasco from the Resguardo Indígena Cañamomo Loma Prieta uh, and um, Vivian Weitzner, uh, who is with uh, Forest People's Program Colombia uh, and also with uh, CIESAS in uh, Mexico City. The, Center for uh, Studies in Social Anthropology. Muy buenos días. Eh, bueno, eh, quiero antes eh, I a, I know, I'd like to thank the spirits of my people who are accompanying me. I'd like to thank the spirits that protect us and I thank Mother Earth. I would like to thank some elements. Here are some plants and natural species that we gather on our territory. This is what we do with these. We, uh, to honor the spirits and to ask uh, for, to have good energy to inspire us and protect us. So, uh, 
you can uh, pass uh, these plants around these uh, this this uh, this bottle of essential oil. I think, think Ms. Weisner, who was our friend and comrade, she's an international advisor on this path uh, for this common path of ours, and uh, she accompanies us in the different organization. Uh, she has been accompanying us now for seven years, and, and our, she helps us, the, our, pe our people, with our struggles and our work. Uh, I'd also particularly like to thank you. Thank you for allowing us to take part in this uh, symposium and uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to accompany you. We uh, crossed uh, mountains and seas uh, in long distances to come and join you. So thank you very much. I'm Hector Jaime Vinasco. I am from the Capias. I work for the RICL. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me when the ask us uh, to share the work we do in Colombia with Forest People Program. For this organization, and also, she's also part of my uh, thesis committee, so thank you very much. I'd like to start and to talk about a violent situation that the indigenous people have to encounter throughout the world and also see that in the Colombian context, the situation is quite uh, particular. And the Jaimez coming from, from in his area, there are two uh, protection units that protect them. There's a national protection unit there to protect him because the Inter-American court that also protects him because he's working on enemy files on the human rights in Colombia. Uh, these human rights uh, files are very specific, and he has to be protected by bodyguards. It's always an honor for me to share this space with actor Jaime Vinasco, and I hope you'll be able to ask us some questions afterwards. Our project is work that was uh, that began uh, uh, some time ago uh, to defend our territory through this initiative, and you, you see this here. We will, but here is our location. This is Colombia for the national context. Colombia is a nation that has 32 departments, 48,000 inhabitants, 48 million inhabitants in our country. Uh, 64 languages, uh, 102 peoples live there. One, 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 uh, and there's uh, a, a million uh, some, uh, indigenous peoples as well, a million, 178,000. And there's uh, 60, uh, 70 reserves, uh, resquados, resquados, these are uh, protected uh, reserves, uh, which are protected by the, con uh, the Constitution. There is a quantity of communities that continues to battle, to fight, to, to have their rights recognized in many uh, uh, international and national organizations national, local, regional uh, organizations according to the different departments. We have a very specific characteristic in dealing with the uh, native uh, indigenous, the protected indigenous zone. 8% of the territory are for the indigenous communities and only uh, 0. Uh, uh, 0.3%, well, we don't really see this up here. And in the national context, Colombia, is a nation that has international importance regarding the recognition of ethnic uh, peoples at the constitutional level. The struggles for the constitution of uh, 1991 
enabled our indigenous comrades to take part in the constitutional uh, um, committee as well. They had to work very hard to ensure uh, the inclusion of uh, Section 7 that recognizes ethnic and cultural diversity of our nation and the Section 1330. We had to work very hard so they would recognize our territories. And uh, Section 90 that protects uh, our fundamental rights, the exercise of fundamental rights and uh, self-government. And there are many regulations outside uh, that were considered uh, outside the courts as well. And it's a question of documents as on paper. Unfortunately, we just came, uh, we just emerged from a situation where many of our brothers and sisters were injured or even killed. Many were killed in this struggle. They were uh, fighting to um, to have their rights, uh, def to defend their rights, and they were struck by violence. We, uh, they were just asking the Colombian government to ensure that these uh, constitutionally entrenched rights would be applied, enforced, and there are uh, 2,000 uh, agreements as well signed by the government. Now we have to uh, apply them as well, enforce them. And now the government says, well, you want us to sign something uh, in secret? What is there to be signed? Well, they'll sign it, no big deal. They'll sign it, but they just won't respect what's been signed. There's no problem to have the government sign documents. The problem is the uh, non-enforcement uh, or the, the non-respect of what's said in these uh, agreements, uh, 1,200 agreements signed by the government, fine, but most of these treaties and agreements have not been fulfilled. So regarding international law, it's the same thing. Many uh, complex issues with the presidents and uh, different uh, ministers as well dealing with the different civil servants representing different institutions, but of course there's the question of uh, informed uh, prior consent as well. There is a cons consultation and consent process as well, but they don't uh, recognize uh, previous processes, which were the very uh, crux, the very reason, uh, the foundation of the rights to consult consultation and informed consent, like many other countries mentioned. Uh, for these agreements uh, uh, enable the existence of uh, compensation measures as well. And we sign agreements with the uh, companies as well. But for the civil servants as well, those who uh, treat or process these uh, prior informed uh, agreements, they're not really civil servants. They are actually the spokespersons of uh, private companies. Their interest is with private companies, even if they have the uh, uh, position of a civil servant. So right now, uh, these laws are not enforced, even if they are written down. And there's questions of human rights violations on our uh, territory, as Vienna mentioned very well. This is a theme that says that the situation is quite alarming. And uh, despite all the great efforts and the international level and the work done by our friends and all those people who are working for indigenous peoples, and uh, the, uh, despite all the works for the defenders of human rights, and we're working hard, there are many defenders of human rights in our country, but they are threatened. And there are a lot of victims in our country. We uh, hear there's uh, even six million victims. Uh, beyond this, this is what we've seen in different units. One example of this in my small municipality. Ooh, there were 500 people uh, who died in less than 50 years, so which is a, uh, a great uh, tragic uh, reality, even in my own village, so we have, uh, I have a lot of hope, and we uh, bear a lot of joy as well. We're very hopeful with what's happening in the different agreements. and. Uh, and this is the case uh, for many indigenous peoples, uh, which uh, fills us with hope. But 
but we hope, we have hope that you will uh, support us so we can uh, have these uh, agreements respected because yes we uh, have a lot of hope for our people we, if we can't uh, uh, conclude this conflict we can at least uh, mitigate it or reduce it so that one day uh, they can uh, end we hope that the vote will be favorable and we can find ourselves in a better reality with uh, regards to applying the law, with uh, regards to the state's responsibility. So we have before us our scenario. We see Caldas uh, here on um, the map of Colombia. We have our reserve, the Paprieta, Canoma Paprieta. It's a small reserve for the population existing on this territory. So 4,826 hectares. We live, 25,000 people live on this small territory, and so we are uh, pretty densely populated. A territory that was fractured, divided, broken into little pieces. Uh, many times during our history, our reserve uh, was much bigger at the time, much bigger than what we see here on this map. It was uh, further than the two mountains, uh, the mountainous areas on both sides. And there's um, histor moments in our history it was uh, broken up and uh, made smaller because of uh, mercenaries and landowners who have used their relationship with notaries, with representatives of uh, government registries, uh, uh, the system uh, in general, and uh, the system of the state, uh, the land uh, system and the corruption, and the question of uh, colonial titles. And uh, from our reserve, we see both extreme extremes. There's Supia, and Ario Sosio, and other municipalities that are very close, and both extremes are for our reserve that uh, make incursions uh, in our territory. That is how pressure is applied. And uh, so these are important uh, pictures, the ones that uh, Vivian uh, was talking about. Oh, that we have some important images, or pictures of our reserve, our resguardo. We have a crest that represents um, our totem, the totem of our communities and our reserve for Rio Socio and Supia. And so we have here an image that is uh, quite uh, um, important, our ancestral community, Kimpaya. Um, lately, it was characterized in this scenario, it's a rich territory, and uh, some of the work that was done by our ancestors, our art was taken to Spain, England, Germany, and our community. Well, there's real, the mania production, an exceptional produ produ uh, artistic production made of gold that was uh, meant, uh, it, was le it led to a lot of wars and, and a lot of different actors for. 1,826 hectares, 37.6 square kilometers. The establishment on the 10th of March, 1540 in Madrid, the borders were defined or redrawn again in 1627 by Order of the Smith, Espinoza, and Salavio. There was all kinds of discussions in 1722, other discussions of a territorial nature that, was very significant, that were very significant with regards to the borders and uh, the uh, uh, limits of our area. And, uh, uh, black populations came to our territory from Africa. They came from certain African regions to work. Uh, uh, and uh, they were working 
Argentinas, they were slaves, and then uh, the colonization in other region of the country that uh, applied pressure on our lands and uh, it produced different conflicts. It's a pretty complex uh, reality, in fact. And uh, so we, uh, beyond this reality, we dream of a situation that is different for the future. And so uh, as we speak, and since uh, um, a little while ago, we have come up with plans on our way of living, our plans of life, plan de vida, so that our communities can uh, get beyond this. Uh, so our mountainous reserves that are visible and here uh, is one of the important mountains where this essence comes from that helped us to begin this presentation. We hope that all of this can be preserved and improved. The spirituality is very important in our, for our people. This is a principal image here. One of our medicine men that is doing a ritual, it's a harmony of spirituality. We do this ceremony, this sacred ceremony, before all our activities. It's a very important. We also have a project on um, food sovereignty and uh, agricultural sovereignty and ecological agriculture and uh, organic uh, um, production. And we are working on our, our reserve is uh, businesses, uh, multinational, of the nature of, uh, of metal, multinational Canadian ones. And uh, our brothers have worked in the mines. Our community has worked in the mines. And we have to have some legal protection for our community. We wanted to create our own model of management. And so organizationally, this is a structure that we thought was very important to be able to manage what we are doing in the center. Is the government structure, the governor, the council. We have here those who were governors. We carry this uh, stick, uh, the commandant's stick, um, what we call it, and we have nine governors that are part of the Council of Government and 32 communities. Each community names a representative for this structure, this active and buildable structure, and where you have um, many communities, municipal councils. We all work together to create our own concept of government and many structures. We work uh, in a reserve uh, administration management, uh, uh, justice, uh, cultural elements, autonomy. We don't have time to talk about all these aspects, but we have a lot of uh, work uh, that uh, we do. We try to work on all these issues at once. This is one of the most important assemblies in our community. These community assemblies are there to uh, where we define most of our policies and actions. Most of our actions uh, of government, that is where they are legitimatized, legitimatized and uh, these different elements gain legitimacy. So uh, our history has been very difficult. We've been through a lot so far, problems of security, um, problems of murder, uh, our people dying, and, um, and uh, there's an image that shows the result of the massacre of Rodula. People were assassinated uh, in Katharina and other members of our leaders' community and uh, particular, from particular areas. Participation of the state and armed forces and paramilitary forces um, in this massacre. And uh, unfortunately, it's one of the many examples of violations of human rights in our country. And we see here images of the National Mining Agency and different titles that they hold.
hold on our territory. These are private title for multinational corporations. Uh, Mr. Salazar was assassinated on the 7th of April 2015, where he was uh, fighting against these multinational corporations because they had to, they, he wanted respect for ancestral mining activities. We want to manage our own mining activities and working in that direction. Our camarade was working to defend our territory, and he was assassinated. Many threats have been received as well. We don't have enough territory. The population is too big. The reserve is too small. The policies of the state is always uh, we're discussing things, but there are no discussions on important things. So the government says we don't discuss the mining code. It must be respected uh, our, uh, as such um, and uh, to benefit uh, the multinational corporations and ancestral mines and difficulties are not well perceived by the state and so armed conflict arises and creates many problems for our laborers and uh, the work we want to do. I don't want to be um, overly pessimistic. I want to uh, let Vivienne talk about our work and work on the multi-ethnic files. I'm happy to be here. And in 2012, we put together a program. There was the North Sud Institute uh, and uh, multinational corporations that are Canadian that are in Colombia. More than 65% uh, of the business in Colombia are Canadian business, Canadian mines, working with the North Sud Institute of Canada, we have put together the first phase of our work, and what we have done is to reinforce uh, these organizations. Um, we do some training work, education in uh, international law, and uh, the rights of First Nations. This is work between the First Nations, the um, and to have a African uh, descendants. There's some conflict because of the policy of the state between these populations. Because of these projects, we are, have started working together to be able to really evaluate the situation in each territory and what needs to be done. So and also so we can be stronger nationally we're facing these issues. So the first second phase, we started working directly on a more active form with the Forest Peoples Program. We have continued to do uh, our research and. Uh, um, as well as our work on the ground and between ethnic communities nationally, internationally, with regards to the uh, free and informed consent um, and the prior consent. And there's a mining structures, but also there's a territorial issue, national issues, not just for the mines, but territorially and nationally. That was our objective because of the great threat that we are facing and because of ancestral mining activities activities uh, proper to the, um, the, uh, the um, uh, First Nations of the, uh, uh, the indigenous people that are criminalized in the country. We're also working on an international project, a project for the university uh, in Norway, a university in Norway on life uh, sciences. We work on extracting in Peru, Ecuador, Ecuador, and Colombia. Because the case of justice regarding resource extraction, we work together as academics and university um, students and activists. These are some of the themes and subjects that we are working on. We don't have time to cover all of that, but I want to talk about uh, what's more interesting in internal regulation. So this is my colleague. Our task and the exercise is exercising the task of government and relative to mining activities in Article 246 that gives us the right to free um, exercise of our governmental rights or our governance rights. So it creates institutional possibilities that rest on international law. And so we have decided to legislate to, for our community, and we have communities, uh, communities for resolution for many activities where we want to apply these regulations on our territory that legislate uh, and uh, have a f uh, we have a framework for all the activities, uh, mining and uh, artisanal and uh, um, uh, on our territory and the uh, regulations on the exclusion uh, zones for mines of medium and large uh, size that we exclude um, uh, 
these large mining operations, and we are working on developing uh, ancestral mining. Resolution 747, despite the fact that a great part of our territory contains um, uh, gold uh, extraction zones that are wonderful, but everything is not accessible for mining activities. So we have marked off the territory, and we have said that certain zones are exclusion zones, protected zones, sacred areas, sacred mountains, for example. There's no act mining activities as possible there. Resolution 748 that regulates the protocols of uh, consultation and free and informed consent and tools that, uh, legal tools that we have now with uh, regards to what needs to be done. The Assembly of Miners, this is an assembly of our association of miners in Samika with hundreds of miners and all those who work in these mining activities must be part of this association, Asomikas, um, or if not, you don't have a quota to operate. So there's a strict control on the environment with regards to the organization as well. Strict control relative to chemicals. They are outlawed. You cannot use chemicals for mining activities. You cannot use them for cleaning up the resources, mercury, cyanide, other chemicals are not uh, allowed, and we have taken, uh, undertaken to encourage proper and responsible activities to uh, respect Mother Earth. This is the um, uh, closing of a mine. Why? Because there's non-satisfaction of uh, the uh, regulations, and we have closing this mine uh, for good because the mining activities create spills in um, watersheds for environmental reasons. We have closed the mine. As many of you, we have uh, called on the justice system, and we, with many uh, organizations, we have uh, put together legal action, and so the International Court uh, is looking at our file, uh, national courts as well in our country. We uh, demand that our rights are protected. We have also asked that the, the title that were signed uh, with regards to our territory are non-constitutional and non-valid that go against the constitutional and, and international law. We aspire as well that the decision of the courts be favorable to us so that we can be protected on our territory. We have built some important alliances and Vivienne will talk about that in uh, just a second. So, with regards to the actions that we have undertaken uh, jointly with the peoples of African descent and nationally, we have exerted pressure so that we can have some influence at the national level. In 2014, from 2014 to 2018, we have tried to make it so that we would be listened to to protect mining activities and ancestral mining things because it's a mine that is different from the multinational mines. So we learned a lot from these pressures that we continue to apply and use. And so it's difficult to work internationally for um, indigenous peoples. And so it is also difficult to defend our rights nationally, whereas in our communities there's so much to do internationally and nationally. And so we have had a very good relationship with the Norwegian Embassy because they defend the peace process and they have come with their representative onto our territory to exert pressure so that the impunity regarding uh, Salazar's murder be resolved. We have friends uh, and alliances internationally with authorities in Norway. So we have twice a year we have workshops, inter-ethnic workshops where we we work on joint strategies with African descent populations for joint action.
actions internally and externally. This is uh, an overview of the event that we've had. 180 people have participated to redefine what these activities are and ancestral mining, what it is and how it is protected legally, what is important. We needed consensus. We needed to arrive at a consensus so that we can be on the same page with regards to defending our rights. We have many products that uh, come out of this work. We have videos, we have booklets, we have calendars, we have workshop reports, analytical syntheses, analytical academic articles as well, articles that come from uh, a collaborative effort. So towards the future, we are running out of time here, but for the future, what we're looking at, uh, we have seen that there are a lot of important elements, alliances internationally, for example, it's very important for us to be seen internationally, uh, accompanied by organizations like Cicada, and um, being accompanied by Cicada is very important, this kind of collaboration. And um, it is vital for us to work with our allies. We work on our territory, and what we do is very important to defend our territory. There are many campaigns, environmental campaigns, for example. One of our environmental campaigns is plant a tree for the reserve. 30,000 trees will be planted, so plant a tree for the reserve, it's called. 300 or so planted were, trees were already planted on our territory. We have the uh, team uh, here to see, and then this picture here, the team that works on that, we work on the, with the Guada team, and that's very important to us. Uh, um, so, um, in a very uh, special way, we have the intention of working to protect our lands legally, to map uh, our lands and defend our rights and continue to plant the seeds of justice. Thank you for your attention. It is a very extraordinary work that you have done and that you continue to do. I would like to bring up one important point. Victor did not come empty-handed. He has a lot of publications and important uh, uh, work that he has done. The program, uh, Forest People Program, we will try to um, the inaudible comment translation in Spanish is not there. What is happening? What is happening? Do you hear me? One, two, one, two. Do you hear the French translation? Those who hear the French translation, please uh, lift your hand, put up your hand. People who listen to the French translation. If uh, somebody is listening to the translation, is there a problem uh, with some of uh, the headsets? Or does somebody hearing English to Spanish? One, two, do you hear me? Are you listening to us in French? Those who are listening in French, please lift your hands. So it's working in French. It's the other channel that is not working. This is the English channel, French English. Do you hear me on this channel? Please be patient for a moment. We're going to fix the translation problem. So the publication projects we are going to try to but, uh, no, that's Spanish. I can't do Spanish. And so uh, here for all of us, um, so I'm just saying that uh, 
On va essayer electronic form, uh, eventually all of them and we'll uh, we'll put them on our website and uh, I, I think that uh, there's an enormous amount to be learned uh, from from uh, the experience of uh, of, our, of our friends in uh, in this area. Um, mining is a Está bien? Ok. <laughs> so, m mining is a tremendously important issue for uh, several of our partners, and uh, we're going to be uh, talking more about that over the next uh, few days. So, uh, let's just take um, um, a, a few minutes into the break time uh, for uh, questions, comments. Um, Nico. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Colin. Thank you very much, Cameron, for your presentation. I have found it very interesting, uh, very informative. I was very impressed. The, um, you know, the difference between the ancestral mining and industrial mining, that's a very interesting concept. In McGill, I believe we have a research group and we analyze the different conditions necessary so that a mine, um, for example, in Ecuador, so that it could satisfy constitutional law. For example, mining activity that does not go against the ecosystems, because ecosystems have the right to exist, uh, but uh, the indigenous peoples have uh, the right to defend and conserve uh, these resources for future generations. And so my question refers to this distinction that you make between industrial and ancestral mining. So what are the means of evaluation that you have to really make this distinction relative to the impacts that are so-called acceptable? And so there was a thesis that was written by a student um, and uh, this uh, thesis, it mentions that there was mining activity where we extracted silver pre-colonization. And so it was ancestral mining. And the Inca peoples have said in their history when they lived from the mine, these activities must stop. Even Incas have said it because it goes against the interest of the people. So I want to, uh, I'd like to know what are the criteria that allow you to determine when there's mining activities, um, ancestral mining activities, uh, sustainable ones, and what's the difference between uh, industrial, uh, those and industrial mining activities? What are your criteria? Thank you very much uh, for your question. And it will allow me to uh, go a bit further into a few things that I wanted to mention. First thing that's very important for us is the legal uh, legality of things. Resolution 031 is a marker, is a framework for our organization, our ancestral governance on our reserve. And so that's the key point. How did people organize themselves ancestrally in the past around these mining activities? Secondly, for as far as the government goes, we said with Vivian, Vivian said that we have three important scenarios, the discussion around that. First point is the discussion with multinational corporations, dialogue with them uh, with regards to how to uh, talk with them, how to face them, how to let them know that this is a territory where we already um, have some legal resolutions where we cannot have large-scale or even medium-scale mining. We only allow ancestral mining. That is already decided upon. Uh, one important element that is difficult is being able to work with the government. It's very difficult because in Article 037, I think, it says that uh, the underground belongs to the state, and so the state can determine the right 
rights of those resources uh, to those resources and the communities they say, they say that the communities don't have the capacity to do this mining development but we challenge that vision because it's very clear that the companies cannot come to our land and lie to us these private companies are not responsible we know that complete zones on the planet were devastated by their mining activities we know the disasters that these mining companies leave behind and that is why we have clearly said to the government that we want there to be special regulation around indigenous persons that there be a special section in the national mining code regarding indigenous peoples so that we when we are working with Vivian we are exerting pressure um, around that issue nationally and so we also want to dictate some terms we are um, considering many scenarios with regards to this uh, internal uh, responsibility for mining no uh, chemicals for example we made some agreements on that second element is environmental responsibility they must themselves be stewards of the environment and then we have, must satisfy the authorities um, which is which is us really and we must protect the environment and so we have regulations to be able to do that we have a technical person who's responsible for environmental issues and an environmental engineer who will make sure and who will examine every mine and every activity and make sure that all of them are in line with our environmental regulations we have the capacity to shut down a mining activity if they do not comply a long-term closure definitive closure or a suspension of mining activities we have received threats intimidation we have uh, been shot at we uh, they tried to throw us out of our territory and saying that we uh, that we will uh, stop mining uh, but um, the person who takes care of social security and security and health and safety we have people who do that uh, with uh, regards to the rights of workers and their protection. So if there is, is mining activity and if they hire workers, sometimes it's their own workers, but if they, they security, um, uh, the costs of covering the protection of health and safety and salaries, all of this has to be guaranteed. So we have to ensure that this is all protected. Thanks for this presentation on the government practices, something that's quite relevant in all the contexts. And, and we just explained what happens with the control mechanisms. We mentioned that there is a resolution on uh, prior informed consent. It's a resolution on this consent. How, how does this exist? You, there, are, there could be governments that seem to be more progressive on paper, but they have other priorities. So what is the connection between this resolution and, and the government standards? Thanks for giving me this opportunity to continue to speak. Regarding our resolutions, it depends on the uh, internal workings of the government. This helps uh, these uh, resolutions to be carried out, but then there are tools that we should have our own tools to allow us to uh, fight uh, these government, uh, government apparatus. We have to deal with the mining companies, the Ministry of Mines as well, the governments, the different ministries who want to uh, deny the rights of this resolution, but the resolution is has already been entrenched and protected due to the uh, scenario set up by the by international law and in, in the international agreements. So, therefore, we'll try to lobby uh, 
for these rights. This is the case of the uh, agreement on uh, indigenous rights. And uh, the notion of prior and informed uh, consent does not, uh, does not recognize international right. Most of the people, including the directors of this authority, don't know what prior uh, consent. They don't even know what consent is. So there are violent uh, confrontations. But Thank you. the companies with mining operations should not enter, uh, not even be on our territory because of these provisions. Uh, so I would, uh, yeah, encourage uh, us to, uh, to take a break now, but to, to, but to be back uh, uh, by, uh, by half past. And uh, we, can, we can keep more or less on, on, on track. And, and thanks to those who have already spoken, really, for, for being quite disciplined uh, in uh, keeping to the, to the time.